Good. Well, let me tell you, uh, I'll give you a little bit of my story, which will lead into the PowerPoint and some things that I want to share with you. Um, we do have, um, Jeff has graciously given me the biggest chunk, so I am going to, uh, it gives me plenty of time. I do not feel rushed, and I want you to, uh, there will be um, definitely some time that we can interact. I'm going to throw some things out that I think will really stretch your brain a little bit. At least I hope so. I assume most of your brains are stretchable at this hour. So, um, but uh, I'm actually originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and uh, found out yesterday that Jeff is also from yeah, yeah, originally from Wisconsin. So, and I, I've always been a bird lover. As far back as I can remember, I've always loved birds. When I was a kid in Wisconsin, I wanted all of those, every wild bird to come to my house. So all you know, I'd have the bird baths and the bird houses and and uh, and greetings, welcome. Hey. Are you looking for the goat workshop? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I wanted all those birds to come to my house, and uh, so I I have loved birds forever and ever and ever as far back as I can remember, and I um in the late seventies my parents got tired of the Midwest snow. I'm not sure what they were thinking, but they got on an airplane, they flew to Denver, Colorado, right? What are they thinking? Then flew to Salt Lake City, spent a couple of days there, and then they, uh, they flew to Portland, Oregon, happened to hit it on a sunny day, and went across the river into southwest Washington State and fell in love with that area. So in the middle of December, in the late, I think it was 78 or 79, Mom and Dad load us five kids up, and across the United States we moved. Dad bought an old school bus, painted it red, found out he couldn't use a yellow school bus as a moving vehicle, so painted it red. So if you've ever seen, like, the Beverly Hillbillies, that's kind of, we were part of that little groupie there. So, so that spring, my dad bought the lovely Cornish Cross Chicks. My dad's originally from West Virginia, and uh, so he's like, we're going to do chickens like we did when I was a kid, boy, come on. So we got some of the Cornish Cross Chickens. How many of you raised those before? See the hands? Okay, great, all right. And uh, I got some Rhode Island red chicks, all right? And uh, I still have scars on the back of my leg from King Tut. That was his name. That was a terrible bird. I would have never, <laughs> to this day, I'd never put him in a breeding pen, but that was King Tut. That was my introduction to poultry. Then I got involved in a great 4-H club at that time. And, and all of us 4-H kids, there was a bunch of us, and our leader probably loved poultry more than all of us kids put together. So we traveled all over the Pacific Northwest showing poultry, exhibiting poultry. They had the Oregon State Fair and the Puyallup Fair over near Seattle, and we'd go to poultry shows in Northern California and over to Idaho and all over Oregon and Washington. And along the way, I'd see these... Uh, these poultry judges, they fly in from all over the country, and I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. So that was one of my childhood aspirations, was to be a chicken judge. And uh, so in 1994, I got licensed by the American Poultry Association, and uh, since then I've judged in probably 35 states, judged in Canada a couple of times, uh, judged in Australia five times. Now Jan will be one. You'll want to become a chicken judge. Yes, I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so for, for 25 plus 30 years, I've been one of you. And what I mean by that is just a backyard enthusiast, a backyard fancy, or a backyard poultry person. All right? Raised probably 50 different breeds and varieties of chickens, ducks, geese, and turkeys. I've never raised a guinea. And, uh, but, um, and so... And then about 10 years ago, I made a career change. Uh, I, um, I went to work in the turkey industry. And we raised about a million turkeys a year for the company that I work for uh, in California. Now, you might think that's a lot of turkeys, but actually the largest turkey producer at the time when I worked for this, we, this company, there was um, Foster Farms raises, at that time, raised about 14 to 16 million turkeys in the state of California. So we were definitely a small guy. But my job was to, I was a field supervisor. And my job was to make sure the five ranches that I supervised, and we raised about 450,000 of those birds a year, to make sure that each of these farms would raise the turkeys the diesel way. Now that means 
exactly the way the, you know, make sure that my ranch managers and all the ranches raised the birds the way the company wanted them to be raised. Well, the longer I worked for the company, uh, the more, you know, first of all, I was like, cool, we're going to do it organically, we're going to do it naturally. That means we're going to raise turkeys the way that I think turkeys, you know, should be raised. And the longer I worked for the company, the more I learned about the industry, both about chicken and turkey, I became more and more disturbed. Um, and uh, so, and then eventually I was learning things about the chicken and the turkey that you eat that probably I should not tell you too much about or you might stop eating turkey and chicken altogether. But maybe that would be a good thing, right? So, um, so worked for the company for several years and it just got worse and worse and worse to the point where there was a, a decision I needed to make. Just that it was um, my eth ethically, uh, my concern for the birds, my concern for the consumer, my concern basically about the, uh, the chicken and the turkey factory farming issue. Uh, that, was, that was my concern. So I eventually um, left the company, took this big step of faith, and started the International Center for Poultry. And basically, um, I, was, um, I didn't have any income. So I started this organization, and for the last several years, I have been speaking, doing a lot of consulting, uh, speaking in different platforms uh, with Cooperative Extension, uh, started a number of sustainable poultry or sustainable agriculture programs around the country um, through Cal Poly, uh, University of San Luis Obispo, did this, um, you know, did some things here at the University of Montana, the University of Alaska, and then... Uh, um, and along the way, I had a, a, there was a lot of growing excitement down in uh, the southeast part of the United States, which North Carolina, if you, you, know, you know North Carolina at all, it's you know, one of the big poultry producers. And, uh, but a lot of people like yourselves who are concerned about the food you're eating and the birds that are being raised and, and, and wanting to become local and sustainable, it was really, really growing and taking off down in uh, several years ago, and so I was there teaching a small farming conference, and um, the, uh, uh, the guy who organized all of that, he, um, he uh, put, you know, took care of my flights and everything else, and took care of my housing, and put me in the Hampton Inn in Marion, North Carolina, and uh, uh, while I was there staying at the Hampton, I, um, there was this lovely lady, her name is Melissa, she was working the front counter. And I always say to people, she checked me in, and I checked her out, and now I'm married to her. <laughs> so we got married, it'll be three years in July, and uh, so we did the, uh, when I met her, we did the kind of long-distance dating relationship thing, and said, this isn't working, she's in North Carolina, I'm in California, and uh, so I took her to the beach in California, you see the Golden Gate Bridge there, and we got married on that beach right there, and um, so now we're in North Carolina have been there since, uh, like I said, just about three years. And since then, even the last three years, the, we started this Carolina Heritage Poultry Coalition, which has launched even bigger into the Sustainable Poultry Network, uh, which is rapidly growing from coast to coast. And uh, so I'm going to show you a little bit of the website and just kind of what our mission and vision is and even how it ties into what's happening in Montana. And uh, But I'll, I'll come back to that. So... What I want to do, I want to give you my background because I think it's, we're able to connect some dots that uh, would probably have some similar vision, some similar concerns, some similar interests of being local and sustainable. Now I will tell you that my connections to Montana, when I lived here, I was obviously very involved in a lot of poultry shows, um, judging the county fairs. I'm usually here every August judging a fair somewhere in the state. and so. Um, but we also are working with breeding farms. Uh, Sharon has a certified flock of Buckeye chickens. I'm going to show you some pictures of those. We've got other flocks uh, throughout, mostly on, from about you know Great Falls to Helena and then west. Uh, we don't have too much east. Some some work that's going on down in Red Lodge, and um, but it is spreading, and there's some excitement about the heritage breeds of poultry. So um, that gives you a little bit of background of, of where I'm coming from. Let me just show you a couple of other pictures. This is me judging in Australia. That's actually an Ancona chicken. Anybody heard of that bird? Okay, there's very few of them left uh, in the country. 
But um, so this is a few years back. You can see I'm I'm actually judging. Uh, got the Australian poultry standards there. So, but um, I am uh, I definitely want to share with you the opportunities specific to the title of this of today is heritage pastured poultry. The idea of heritage, and, and I want to define that for you in just a second. But here is uh, that's a champion turkey at the Alaska State yeah. Fair. That was one very excited 4 H girl. <laughs> and, uh, so it's, um, this is anybody ever heard of a, a Sarama chicken? All right, they they just come into the United States in 2001. Actually, 9/11 of 01. The birds were in the air headed this way from Malaysia. Got delayed for three days. Three. I think it was more than that. Three days, I think, in Chicago. The birds were being shipped to New Orleans. Oh, wow. Got hung up in Chicago. They were all adult birds, and every single one of them survived. But anyways, there's like the smallest chicken in the world. Really has nothing to do with today, because there's no meat in that burger, right? I mean, you it's just like... But I was judging, and uh, the way you judge these chickens is... Uh, we're actually... The, the three of us are judging the champions. But normally, I sit at a table... And they bring the birds to the table, and they're all, they're all judged on personality and how they strut around, and character is a big part of it. And, uh, but the, the key the thing here I want you to see, I've never, that's the first time I ever judged with Mardi Gras beads hanging around my neck. I told these guys, if I'm going to take a picture with you, I'm going to cover my face. So, um, all right, so this is, a, uh, this is actually a Buckeye chicken. I'm judging this exhibit, uh, this these birds down uh, at a show in Georgia, and um, so, um, but I'll I'll tell you more about the Buckeye chicken. It's an, it, it's uh, it's the only dual purpose chicken that was developed by a woman in the early 1900s. Nettie Metcalf was her name. Guess where she was from? Montana. No, Buckeye. Ohio. Ohio. Thank you. Yeah, poor bird. If you think of Wisconsinites, all right. So Buckeye originated in the state of Ohio. I'll come back and talk a little bit about that. So first thing I want to do is identify for you what exactly is a heritage bird, okay? These four little bullet points are very, very important. They're the foundation of what I'm going to share with you in my presentation, okay? First of all, the bird has to be uh, recognized by the American Poultry Association. That's what APA stands for, all right? American Poultry Association. It's the oldest, the APA is the oldest livestock organization in the country. It was organized in 1873 in Buffalo, New York. One year after they organized, in 1874, they published the first standard of perfection, all right? This is a 1938 edition of the standard of perfection. The standard has over... 200 plus different breeds and varieties of chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys, and recently we've we've added the lovely guinea to the back of the standard. Now I have to judge them. So, <laughs> but, um, so when we talk about heritage, there's a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of messages that are coming out about heritage poultry, and I hope to clear some of that up for you this morning. Okay, so the bird, anything that's that's pre 1950. Okay, now one of the First two breeds, or the two breeds that are the oldest in the standard of perfection, are the Dominique chicken, and better heard of Dominique, all right, and the Barb Plymouth Rock, one of my all-time favorite birds. They both came into the standard in 1874. Okay, so you're talking about when we talk heritage, you can exchange that with a heirloom or a historical old breeds of poultry. Okay, but primarily we're referring to all the breeds that were pre-1950. Now, I should tell you, all your favorite breeds of chickens, almost all of them are pre-1950. So your Rhode Island Red, your Plymouth Rock, your Dominique, your Orpington, okay, uh, your Delawares, your Chanticleers, your New Hampshires, all those breeds were pre-1950, okay? So it has to be, when we talk heritage, it isn't a, you can't say, well, what about the Jim Jan chicken, the one that they made in the last 10 years, okay? When we talk heritage poultry, we're talking about birds that are identified by the standard of perfection, okay? Second thing is the idea that they can naturally mate. Okay, now if you're like me, you would say, well, of course. You know, I was around and my grandmother had chickens or my great-grandmother and I saw the chickens mate. I went out 
to the chicken coop, and I watched that aggressive male chase that hen around, and we saw multiplication, all right? We saw reproduction, all right? Well, let me just tell you something. This was shocking for me and very disrupting to me when I worked in the industry. Do you know that 100%, 100% of all the turkeys that we consume in our country cannot naturally reproduce? You name all the big boys, okay? From Tyson to Jenny O to the company I worked for to Tyson or to, uh, to Draper Poultry, you look at every major turkey producer in our country and 100% of those birds cannot naturally reproduce. Now, so the way it worked in the company I worked for, okay, at Diesel, we would have breeding flocks. And the way that it worked was that a group of guys, the ladies usually didn't get into this, we would teach them how to collect semen for 8 to 10 hours a day. And then they would, you know, spend the next couple of days inseminating the hens, okay? And that's the only way that we could, what I call a man-made turkey, that we could keep the, the, the lines going. Even the Cornish Cross and a number of the hybrid broilers cannot match. They're, they're a terminal bird. They are bred to die. They're created to die. Okay? So if it's a heritage bird, a chicken or a turkey, it has to be able to naturally mate. Believe it or not, that has to be part of the criteria. Number three is a long, productive outdoor lifespan. Okay? Now, I'm definitely, and I'm, I'm, I'm gracious to Jan and Jeff that I get to to get to speak here, but there will, you will definitely see by the time I'm done on which camp that I camp in, okay? So when we talk about, and, and I'll be honest with you, I when we talk about a long, productive outdoor, if you're taking notes, circle that word outdoor, because unfortunately, we're taking an industry bird, we do it with turkeys and we do it with chickens, and we put them out to pasture wanting them to have an outdoor experience. And the problem is, is you're using a bird, don't miss this, that was never meant to go outside. It was meant to have 25,000 or, or 30, whatever the big numbers are, broilers in the turkey industry. We put 8,000 toms in a 25,000 square foot building. They were never bred to go outside. Even my, uh, one of the guys that helped make the Cornish Cross, Paul Siegel, he's in his 80s at Virginia Tech, he says, I, you can blame me. I helped make it, okay? He would say, we're being so destructive, and he would refer to it as a welfare issue, when we take these birds that were developed for confinement and we put them out to pasture. Something wrong with that. Okay, so long, productive outdoor lifespan. Write this down. A chicken, I just talked to a guy on the phone uh, on the East Coast. He's looking for a six-month-old or ready-to-lay pullets. And, uh, but the idea is he keeps them about 12 to 14 months. A chicken should produce, a hen should produce eggs for you for five to seven years. A rooster should produce for about three to five years. Okay? So in the industry, we are working really, really hard to produce a chicken that produces a lot of eggs in a very short period of time, and then they go bye-bye. Okay? <laughs> So, um, a long, productive outdoor lifespan. Number four, this is a biggie. It's called slow growth rate. Now, I've worked really hard to keep the bridges with the industry from being burned. And I have some very good friends in the industry. And one of my very good friends with North Carolina State University, the research center in Salisbury, North Carolina, um, he reminded me, he said, for many years, or about the last 10 years, the fast-growing Cornish cross, on the average, was being processed at 42 days. He said, Jim, it's now at 37 days. Wow. So, uh, and he's referring to the Cornish cross genetics. He says, that bird, that's, that's fast-growing. If you've raised chickens before, take a 30-day, you know, a month-old chick, add seven days, and it's ready to be processed. <laughs> The rate of that growth would be like a two-year-old human being being several hundred pounds in size. It's very fast growing. So, 37 days on a chicken, a heritage bird needs, on the average, of 16 weeks. That's four months. Okay? So, now, if you're, any of you are thinking profit, okay, you now have to, and it's critical, even as we talk, as Jeff talks about some of the numbers and the finances, 
it's critical that you, you make a paradigm shift to say, okay, we're going from fast growing to slow growing. Okay? And now, um, now in the turkey industry, they're the company I work for. We're processing turkeys on the average right now about 14 to 16 weeks. The normal is about 24 to 28 weeks. That's six, 28 weeks to six months. Okay? So let me just tell you something. If you're like, we're going to do heritage turkeys for the marketplace, all right? This year, they have to be, and you're going to buy heritage. you got to get those birds on the ground as in hatched out by about May 15th. you got a little bit of a grace period because Thanksgiving now, this year it falls on uh, the last, or it's always the fourth Thursday of the month. This year it falls on November the 28th, so you're gaining about a week. By the way, that's my birthday, so if you want to run for that, that'd be great. All right, so... That's what we mean by a slow growth rate, all right? Now, I want to show you, I want to talk a little bit more. I want to stir your thinking about genetics with one other, uh, just one other slide here. Well, that's the turkey. I can skip that. I kind of talked through that a little bit. Let me just give you some <coughs> things that I think you should think about with the industry birds, all right? Number one, I want to suggest to you, actually more than suggest, <laughs> that they are genetically engineered and the gen genetics are owned, okay? Take the Cornish Cross Chicken, okay? There's three companies in the world that own all of the genetics of a Cornish Cross Chicken, okay? Two of those are international. The third company, which is very small, down in Georgia, is called Cobb. Maybe you've heard of them, okay? But Cobb is owned by a much smaller company. Maybe you've heard of them. Their name's Tyson. They own the genetics. Here's what it is, okay? The idea is this, is that they've created a bird that is a terminal chicken. I call it the man-made bird, all right? And the idea is that you get these birds, and they're fast-growing, and then you process them, and you have no more parent stock, okay? Because they weren't bred for you to be able to reproduce the bird on your farm. So that's brilliant genetic planning because ultimately what they've created is a bird that you are dependent upon the corporate Tyson company to get your chicks. Okay? So I'm standing, I live in near Asheville, North Carolina. Asheville, North Carolina is kind of like the Santa Cruz of the East. All these young people running it like, we're uh, getting away from the government, we're going to the mountains, so we're going to be local and we're going to be sustainable. And I'll be speaking to a group of farmers just like you, in Asheville, and they're like all about local sustainable, and they're getting their Cornish Cross chick shipped in on a regular, you know, we raise them out for, they do, they're trying to do, you know, 12 weeks or six weeks, and the bird bigger it gets, the harder it is to keep those birds alive. And they're all, and I'm like, okay, so you're dependent upon an outside company for your genetics. You're getting your chick shipped in from different hatcheries around the country, and they come, every three months or every four months or whatever. And farmers, you're calling yourself local and sustainable. And they're all like, hmm, we have a problem here, <laughs> okay? So they're bred for indoors in high density farms. We have all kinds of evidence to show that that bird is growing so quickly that it's growing in pain. The bird actually uh, grows faster than its bone structure and its organs can handle. 100% of the evidence we know that when a bird is dead and on its back, anybody have a Cornish cross do that? <laughs> it's almost 100% a heart attack. Okay? So congestive heart failure, uh, skeletal deformities, they're engineered for confinement. All right? I really believe, okay? I don't have time to go into management today, but your eyes are your best management tool. You know as well as I do that a Cornish cross, what they do best is eat, sleep, and poop. <laughs> That's what they do. Do not say, get up and run around, birds, go, forage, go tear up. They're like, oh, don't ask me to do that, all right? <laughs> they're, they're, they're a large bird. They're engineered to stay inside. Average life is 37 days, number five. They're man-made. They cannot live without man due to the weak immune systems. Um, I, um, I raised a lot of turkeys for 25 years, and it wasn't until I went to work in the industry that I had to figure out, study all the antibiotics and probiotics and all the stuff to keep these birds alive, okay? Let me stop there because on your faces, here's what I'm reading. Anger, confusion, 
uh, like, why are you telling me this? And what about the chicken wheat in Montana? And so let's, um, let me stop there just to dialogue and, and hear a response for a couple of minutes. I just painted you a picture of two different birds. Yes, sir. I, how is the mechanism of, like where you're saying the turkeys can't reproduce, is it a biological thing or is it physical, like it's and behavioral? It's been great out question. Of them? Great question. Okay. So the reason the bird, I use the words here genetically engineered. Okay. I was on the phone with, I can't remember who it was, the last couple of days. We're not talking about genetically modified. Do not. As a poultry person, get those words confused. All right? <laughs> Genetically modified is what we're doing to the grains and seeds and so forth, and, or vegetables or whatever. Okay? Poultry, not yet anyway. <laughs> yeah. They are not genetically modified. Okay? Genetically engineered are words that have, like, uh, they've, it, that word's been around for 100 years. And the idea is with poultry. It's just a matter of selection for breeding. That's all it is. Now, it's, but, but it's a big deal. Because here's what happens. When you take a tom turkey, you know that's the boy, right? Little turkey 101, okay? <laughs> take a tom turkey and a, tom, or a, and a female turkey, a hen, okay? When you cross those, genetically selecting the progeny that grow the fastest is who gets to go to the next breeding pet. So in turkeys, it's all about rate of growth. So a turkey that grows fast, a tom, that's daddy, put him back in. And they get bigger. So what happens is bigger breasts, bigger breasts, farther forward, farther forward to a point where they physically are unable to mate. Okay? All I need, let me walk onto your farm, and I can tell by the way a turkey stands, by the way a turkey walks, what kind of a bird you have. Okay? Now, let me explain this a little further. What happens, George Nicholas, all right, he was the grandfather of the industry turkey in Sonoma, California. And there's a line of turkeys now that's, at one point, they were the largest producer of turkeys in the world. But his breeding lines of turkeys were in Sonoma County. Now, all of those turkeys are, those breeding turkeys are in Lewisburg, West Virginia. And they raise, I mean, and none of these, none of them can naturally reproduce. And they are producing a, a bronze and the auburn colors. And, and I'm in a little battle right now of, with Whole Foods, who's using it. Yeah, well, I'm not going to. But <laughs> <laughs> that's a rabbit trail. So I think it's key. But what I was going to say about George Nicholas is his vet, one of his vets that worked for him, is still alive in, in Blacksburg. Virginia, Virginia Tech, he's in his 80s or 90s. And why these guys are still as sharp as a tack, I'm soaking everything I can from them about history of genetics and poultry genetics in our country. And, and Cal Larson told me, I said, Cal, how did you know, it's tied into what you were asking, how did you know when you guys went one generation too far with selecting for rate of growth and big turkeys? He says, this is how we knew. When we opened the incubator and there would be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little baby turkeys that legs were all sprawled out because they could not stand. We would go, oops, we went one generation too far. So all I, I want you to think about this. What I'm most excited about in the state of Montana, do you realize probably 99.9% .9 of all the bird consumed in your state is from somewhere else? If we're going to create a local, sustainable movement of poultry in this state. We've got to get away from these fast-growing engineered birds or fast-growing rate of growth selected birds and go back to the old heritage breeds of poultry and small local farms working together for the sake of, of being sustainable. Yes? So I have a question. Our um, poultry specialist at AIMCAD, Spence, <coughs> he has think almost 10,000 birds at this point, but his, his issue is um, the feed. So um, are you going to talk a little bit about how much feed it takes? Yeah, Jeff or? will. Jeff's going to hit on that. <laughs> and, and definitely, anyway, I don't want economics. I'm talking about the <laughs> bird, um, the feed to, <clears throat> to meat conversion yeah. ratio. And, and we have... Our, our movement with using these birds is growing like crazy across the country. So we have a number of farmers 
that are punching the numbers, and it's working. It's very, very exciting. So some of what, I, I will, Jeff and I talked about this at dinner last night. He will punch some numbers, and some of the, I, I think what you're going to get from him is going to be a great asset for you, but it may involve just adjusting some numbers because you're using a different bird. We'll see when we get to that content. Okay? Yes? Yeah, that would be, you know, the feed conversion in our growing season. So the short as it is in Montana, yeah. the feed conversion. I mean, we were July 1st when we had chicks, it was 43 degrees. So how do we, you know, with a, with a slower growing bird, how do you program that into our growing season? I, I think that's a huge concern, and we, and we need to address that. Let's wait and do that on the economic side. Yeah. Um, well, I just want to share, we have two wild turkeys that have been domesticated. And um, I think I'm probably one of the rare people to ever seen a turkey breed. <laughs> and it's like, come on, come on. I mean, it's just like, these are nice, little skinny little turkeys, you know, agile. <laughs> still, come on, you can do this. I mean, it was, it was an amazing process. Oh, yeah. But our birds... These two wild birds will produce chicks that will be fattened by Thanksgiving on wild forage. <coughs> so there's something here about the genetics and how you know different types of systems will bring bring those birds to maturity yeah. and to be alive. And these they are not bad. Hmm. It's forage. Yeah. And they're fat. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. good. But I wanted to share the breeding story. That's great. Right. Yeah. As you're saying, you know, Can they don't you? breed. I saw, like, even the wild ones have a hard time doing it. Do <laughs> <laughs> you want to go and demonstrate? Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, like terminology with the genetically engineered versus genetically modified, I think that could be confusing to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, just the, the areas where that technology was innovated bacteria, mammalian cells, um, they call that genetically engineered. Um, so I don't, and I think you're referring to specific more breeding, selective breeding sort of things. Um, right. Well, so, I mean, a lot of people hear genetically engineered, they're going to associate it with what you're calling just modified. That's right. And, and I think it's critical for you as a farmer, uh, as a, a person who's learning, that you're able to explain the difference. I think that's critical. Yeah, we actually have a publication on this, which I wrote, and it has to do with, with crops. But the real good word to start using is called transgenic rather than genetically modified. And the reason is because you're transferring genes between two unlike species. That's where it changes from genetic engineering to GMO or transgenic. So in other words, if you were to take a duck or a turbo gene and put it in a chicken, that would be transferring the genetic material, which doesn't happen by any kind of natural way. That's actually what happens with crops. They actually put uh, viruses and other things that would never be able to breed with a corn plant, and they actually convert, they actually insert the genes physically into the, into the plant. So transgenic, I think, is a really important word because so many people confuse the genetic engineering. And if you key on the word transgenic, then you're really talking about the significant, a significant difference yeah, good. in what you're doing. Good, good. Any other thoughts on the comparison of the two birds? Or I want to turn this positive now. You ready? <laughs> So, oh, I had to show you a picture. <laughs> unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, part of my concern with this, I judge fairs all over the country. And I love how the, you know, or I, I dread, regret the fact that the industry is pushing this so heavily amongst young people. And uh, so um, there's your champion market poultry over in Astoria, Oregon. And, and uh, I don't, you know, those chickens... They look really healthy and standing well, don't you think? Yeah. All right. I'm just kidding. All right. So when we're identifying heritage culture, if I was going to spend eight hours with you on breeding, okay, we would walk through these three things. We would say, give us vitality and vigor, and what does that look like? And we'd spend time talking through that. How do you select the birds for that? We would talk about APA standard qualities, okay? See, here's the thing about this book, all right, the Chicken Bible, all right? The New Hampshire chicken, early 1900s, and the Delaware chicken, okay? Pre-Cornish cross, those were the top two meat birds in our country. The New Hampshire and the Delaware chicken, okay? And so, and the people who said, you know, when you turn to the Lamona chicken, it was those who bred them 
This was the commercial manual pre-1950. This is what was used for the commercial industry to say, how do we reproduce the Langshan chicken or the Leghorn chicken or the Plymouth Rock chicken? This was the manual. So you're talking about 125 plus years of history. And so I teach people is how do you begin to select birds based on these standard qualities, all right? Why don't I pass that around so you guys can take a look at it. And then thirdly is the idea of it being, uh, what are its production qualities? So we're teaching you how to produce a bird that can have, uh, if it's a dual purpose chicken, and I'm gonna talk more about that, it needs to be, uh, dual means it's for meat and for eggs, okay? So, um, now, for an example, one of the things we look for in production qualities is weights. Let me tell you an unfortunate situation right now in our country. Unfortunately, the industry turkey is growing way too fast and, and uh, putting a lot of meat on it in a very short period of time. The other side of the coin is most of your heritage turkeys, almost every turkey you get from a hatchery, from Privet, from Murray McMurray, you're going to get a turkey, this has happened numerous times, you're going to get a turkey that isn't putting enough weight on it because it hasn't been bred over, it hasn't been a, an issue in breeding for the last 50 years because of the industry burden. So we're actually working really hard to say, you want to raise the old bourbon red turkeys? Well, we've got, we've got to breed them and get them back to where they once were, the Narragansett turkey. The bourbon red, or the uh, royal palm turkey, I have a bronze, uh, standard bronze flock. We raised 250 this year, okay, and so and that's small. But the key is, is when you've got, at, at my, my toms, at 28 weeks, had better, wide weight, had better be 25 pounds, okay? You go, and, and but often, they're a lot skinnier than that. So I've had farmers say, I've done the heritage thing, man. I tried to butcher that bird, and I got a little eight-pound carcass, and I couldn't make any money on that. It's no wonder. Bad genetics. Bad genetics. Okay? So, um, now the only, you know, the, probably the best meat bird chicken is a Cornish <coughs> or the Indian game. Now, don't get this confused. This is the bird right here on the cover of this card. It can naturally reproduce. It's one of the breeds we use to make the Cornish cross. Now, it's primarily a meat chicken that can naturally reproduce, but here's the thing, it only lays about 60 eggs a year. And then you add that into the Montana climate, eh, I wonder how to lay up here, right? But that cock bird, that's a male that is over a year old. Cockerel is a male under a year old. A hen is over a year, a pullet is under a year, but you can see the weights there, okay? So let me show you a couple of pictures. That's a male bird, all right? That's a Cornish. You can see the, 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 the boldness of this bird and the muscle and the breast on it and the width across the back and the shank, all right? Obviously, this is, uh, this is an excellent representation of the breed. There's the girl that's on the front of your car. Those are some white laced red Cornish in the background. Um, this is a very, very good flock of Cornish. Great meat bird. That's you know can be bred and developed to be local and be sustainable, all right? So um, let's talk a little bit about exclusive egg producers. Their body type is small and light. We're talking about you know Leghorns, Anconas, Menorcas. Uh, they're small and lightweight. The males are about six to nine pounds. The females are four to six pounds. The earlobes are white. All right. Remember this. If you didn't know this, okay? The color of the earlobe of a chicken will tell you the color of egg it lays. Did you know that? Jan. All right. That's a white earlobe. What color egg does it lay? Well, actually, that's a rooster. But <laughs> this is a, yeah, if you'd like to see that. Yeah. I've had those phone calls and emails. Hey, I think my rooster just laid an egg. <laughs> no, you probably have it in there. Um, but this is, this is a beautiful representation of a light brown leghorn. It's an egg producing uh, a breed, okay? But that earlobe will tell you what color of egg that chicken lays. So all of your Mediterranean breeds will have a white earlobe 
and lay a white egg. Now, if you got a red earlobe, what color egg you get? Brown. Brown. Thanks for not. You did say red, didn't you? <laughs> so a brown, a red earlobe almost always is a, uh, a brown egg. There are a few exceptions, like the Americanas and the Ericanas that lay the Easter eggers. You know, you get the green and the pink and all that. And uh, so, but generally speaking, white earlobe, white egg, red earlobe, brown egg. Okay. So that's a light brown legger. This is a, a flock of white leghorns, and again, you can see the white earlobes on the birds. Now, I also want you to notice, is it right if I, am I screwing oh, up? No, no. I want you to notice, if you go by the middle of her legs and go up, I want you to look at how full the body is on an egg-producing female. That is a hen that produces long haul, all right? These aren't a 12 to 14 month caged egg layer producer. These are birds that will produce for a long period of time. Can I suggest that the girls with a little more in the back end are better producers. <laughs> All right? And so these are, these are, you know, five to seven years. Now, I don't have time to elaborate on this, but you do understand that when a hen molts, she molts once a year, production will always decline a little bit with molt. So don't go, I'm going to get some of these wonderful leghorns and they'll, you know, they, they do take a break too. It's called a molt. All right? And um, so... It's important for you to remember that. There's two excited guys with these. You'll also notice, this. that's exactly right. You know, I was around in California back a few years ago when they had the big caged egg layer. You know, they're, they're now outlawed in the state of California. So now all those egg farmers are taking all their caged egg layers to Mexico, and some of them have come to Idaho, and some of them went to Nevada. I, but I, I want to suggest to you what I'm most passionate about is not the cages, even though that's a welfare issue I'm concerned about. It's the genetics. It's what we're doing to the bird and the changes that we're making. And uh, these guys are excited about the leg. These are dark brown leghorns. Notice the white earlobe. Now, this is a flock in Porterville, California. But you want you to see you've got white leghorns, light brown leghorns, dark brown leghorns, buff leghorns, black leghorns. You have several varieties of the same breed. Okay. And um, so there's the male. Isn't he pretty? Good looking bird. Okay. What do you think of that? Here's what's fun about this. I had this in the egg laying slide because when you go to uh, the good food store in Missoula and you buy cage free eggs <laughs> or even organic, all right, that's the perfect environment right there. There's 1,500 layers. These are cage-free. Don't they look happy and very uh, plenty of space? And, you know? and this guy, it's a little easier for me to show you this slide. Uh, he's about 45 minutes north of us. And he will tell you, I went and visited uh, his farm, and he says, Jim, these girls get to stick around for 14 months. And I have egg demands. <laughs> and so at 14 months, the new pullets are coming. All right? So I said, what do you do with them? Well, you got to remember, there's a small industrialized leghorn. There's not much there. Okay? He says, I'll sell as many as I can to Idjit and farmers, but eventually I just kill them all and we bury them. Okay? So it's very, very common in the, in the industry. Now, some folks are a little bit better stewards of these birds and their dog food or so forth and so on. But I, I want you to see, that's why when we talk about a core value in our network, it's... It's pastured. It does go outside. And within our standards, we say, how do we define that that needs to be defined? Because even the company I work for, I don't have a picture for you. I have got the picture, but not in this presentation. Of our 8,000 toms get to be go out in a little yard area. and But we didn't let them out until they are about 12 weeks old, and they'd be processed about 16 to 20 <laughs> weeks. And so they're like, whoa, what's going on? You just opened up a door. Can we go out? You know, it's kind of like they're, you know, they're a little hesitant kind of thing. So... Anyways, next time you buy range-free eggs, I hope you have this picture in your head, all right? Okay, dual-purpose breeds. These are the birds I'm excited about, okay? Every American breed of chicken is a dual-purpose chicken. So your Rhode Island Red, your Buckeye, your Plymouth Rock, um, your New Hampshire, your Chanticleer, which is the only Canadian creation. We have certified flocks of those in Montana, down in Missoula, okay? 
Okay? Um, but here's what I want, and, and eventually this needs to work out in somewhat of a business plan, is the live weight of, I'm giving you a range of the different breeds, are 8.5 to 11 pounds of live weight. Okay? A dressed weight, here's what we're working toward. Dressed weight is about a four pound carcass. Chefs, uh, restaurants, even the consumer, individual families, they're liking the idea of a four pound carcass. Now I'll also tell you this, it's critical that when we raise a New Hampshire or a Chanticleer or a Buckeye, that we're able to get about a four pound carcass in order for you as a farmer to make a profit. Now I do have some farmers, uh, I have one farmer who, um, he did 20, he's in the Charlotte area, he raised about 2,500 Buckeyes and completely sold out at six bucks a pound. Okay, and plus he's doing um, um, like ground chicken and uh, he's doing, he's even his livers and different, I mean he's just, he's marketing like crazy. Uh, he's using those added, you know, commodities to kind of fix that. Egg production of these dual purpose breeds is 180 to 220 eggs annually. Red earlobes, they lay, lay brown eggs. There's some of the breeds. The Wyandotte, the Dominiques, the New Hampshire, the Jersey Giant Chicken. Okay. Jim, can I ask real quick? Yeah. Six dollar pound, is that cut up? It's not cut up. It's not cut up. Old okay. So, but here's what I want you to think about, about Montana. I get really excited about this. There was a day when all these dual purpose breeds, we didn't have meat birds and egg layers. In the heyday of the, the New Hampshire, and the heyday of the Delaware, they would use the same bird to meet both needs. That was the idea of a dual purpose chicken. And I want to suggest to you, just like Sharon's got a Buckeye flock down in Helena, okay? I want to suggest to you that you as many are doing across the country, you can say, I'm either going to be a breeder of Buckeyes, that's what Sharon's doing, or I want to be a grower, and I'm going to go to Sharon and say, Sharon, I want to grow out 200 Buckeyes this spring or this sometime this year. You hatch me 200 Buckeyes, okay? You can take those Buckeyes, grow them out, use the extra males, have Sharon come over and help you select the breeders, okay? She's an expert now in Buckeyes. <laughs> so... Take the extra males, process them. Use the females either for breeding or for in the layer pen. Okay? You do not, you know, as we move toward this idea of being sustainable and using the old heritage breeds of poultry, you don't need one or the other. Now, in some cases, you might say, I love the dark cornish. That's a really a cool looking bird. Okay? But you also have an egg market. So it would be fine if you want to use a meat breed, okay, and still have black osterworps as your egg producing flock, okay? That's different. But even an Osterlorp is a dual purpose bird. Now it holds the record for the most, as a brown egg layer, it, it holds the record for the most eggs laid in a year, black Osterlorp. I have, we have phenomenal black Osterlorp genetics in our network. And of course our Osterlorp leaders are like, they're like, you know, you're promoting that bird as a brown egg layer. Look at this carcass. And you know, they're texting me, sending me pictures. Look, we processed some, some black ostrilor. Look at how great these birds look. And they really do look good. Here's the thing. Most of your English breeds, the Orpington, the Ostler, they're a white-skinned bird. All the, all the American breeds of poultry are yellow skin. Our people in our country are addicted to yellow skin. So they get a white bark skin and they're like, Ooh, salmonella, what's wrong with that bird? That's got a white skin. It will not hurt you. Okay? It's just an educational piece. Is the skin a little thinner on the white bird than it is on the yellow No, bird? no. That, that, would be, uh, that would be a genetic issue, but it also would be part of what you feed them well. You know. so, um, so these are some poor, important details. See, when we started a few years back, even when I was here, we were in this learning curve. And we're still in this learning curve because you need to understand something. For 50 years, these breeds have been neglected because the Cornish Cross has been on the scene. And we're not going to fix them overnight. Okay? You need to understand that. If you're like, man, we want to be a part of, of blazing this new trail the old way, if you don't have any patience, you might as well jump ship now. That kind of thing. But see, and so some people are like, hey, I got, I got a bunch of roosters from such and such a hatchery. I grew them out for meat. Two and a half pound carcass after 20 weeks. I'm like, yeah, bummer deal. They're like, I'm not doing the heritage thing again. Okay? 
That's why it's critical. It's about the genetics, and it's about a breeding program. It's about growing these birds out and, uh, appropriately. Okay. All right. So let me show you some pictures. What's that? That's a true, very good barred Plymouth Rock. Okay. Most of the barred rock male roosters in your backyard, if I put this male up next to it, you would see a night and day difference. Okay. Um, this is a very good picture. This is a female. Now, Plymouth Rock is dual purpose. I want you to see that what we call the depth of body right here versus the length of body. Okay. This is a very good one. This is a not so good one. These are hatchery Plymouth rocks. You're going, yeah. Yeah, that's going, mine. That's, that's yours mine. right here. Okay. Do you see the difference? And I got to do the backup thing here. Look at her. Look at the depth of body, the length of body. Now, this is typical hatchery barred rock. You do not want to put that in a bag and sell it even to your relatives. Okay. There's nothing to that bird. That is, this bird comes from a hatchery, and what they might do, listen, they might try and improve the egg production so that you're happy with your chicks. They don't care about meat. You backyarders across our country are buying this chicken to produce an egg because we have become so dependent upon the Cornish cross bird. You track them with me? So, that's the barred rock. Anybody know what that is? Not an Orpington. Not a red star. It's actually, I love throwing it out because I, I, I like confusing them. Right? That's a true New Hampshire chicken. Okay, I'm raising these. I'm so excited about getting these back into the marketplace. One of the number one meat birds um, pre Cornish cross days. Now, and they grow. We're, we're aiming, and the heyday of the New Hampshire was 14 weeks. All right? Uh, the Delaware was 12 to 14 weeks, the one that's in the standard. Okay, that's about as fast growing as we would say to stay in the category of a slow growing bird. Make sense? So, but what ends up happening is this is mistaken as a Rhode Island red. You know, because, and I'll, I'll clarify that in just a minute. There's the male. Now, the picture was a little blurry, but I want to, I'm stoked about its wing color and just, a, it's a fantastic breeding male here. Um, anybody know what that one is? There's your Buff Orpington. Okay? I judged this bird at the Oregon State Fair. And uh, I said, God, let's get that bird out on the grass. I need to take a picture of her. All right? Here's a hatchery Orpington. Do you see the difference? Look at her body. Look at her type. Now, it's not a super good shot of her, so I need to give her the benefit of the doubt, but I have seen the bird. But it's, it's a big, it's got some size to it. This is an English breed that was a huge utility chicken in England. All right, again, for meat and for eggs. Okay. So um, that's an Orpington. All right. Those are true, very good black Australorps. Look at that's a little bit of a windy day here, but look at the, the uh, width of back on these birds. Look at the green sheen on them. They're phenomenal. And these birds, uh, these are the genetics that we're using for our Australorps. Up in the mountains, about 3,000 feet in, in western North Carolina. And one of our breeders, she's like bragging about egg production. She's like, Jim, we had several days of cold weather, and I, she has you know, about 50 hens. She says, for days and days and days, I average 40 eggs a day in cold, cold weather. Excellent, excellent bird. They would do well here, uh, along with the Chanticleers and I think the Buckeyes in this climate. Birds have a choice. That's what we have black ostrilers. And they have a choice of being inside or out. Ten below zero, they'll be out sitting on the roof. <laughs> they can go in where it's 30 degrees. Yeah, that's a, that's a, And it that's, doesn't phase their production. Yeah, that's great. That's a sign of a, of a good bird. I love when we talk about vigor and vitality. Um, Angela Krebs, who's got a breeding flock of bourbon reds down in Hamilton, she's like, they're always dragging me. Yeah, our bourbon reds. They, were, they all perch on the fence and... You know, and when it snows, the snow just stacks up on their backs. <laughs> and then they're just in the morning and off they go. You know, that's good bourbon red genetics there, right? Yeah. There they are again. You like those, huh? I'm hearing you in the back. Is that in the back? Anybody know what that is? Silver lace wine. Good job, Jim. All right. 
things? Judge this bird uh, in an exhibit up in, up in uh, Michigan. The Wyandotte was developed in upstate New York. What's the weather like there? Be cold. Another good bird that would do well here. Okay. Now, getting this breed back into production qualities. I'm not talking eggs. I'm talking a dual purpose bird. We've got work to do. All right. There's. I can't point you anywhere right now to get this bird to use it for meat the way it was originally developed and intended to be used. All right. We've but, been selected for plumage for so many years. That's exactly more. right. You're exactly right. Yeah. But I also want you to notice, give you a little, little, another little anatomy lesson. The comb on a chicken. Do you know what the purpose of the comb is? Let me give you two things. One is it regulates the temperature of the chicken's body. So all the blood runs through the comb. Okay? So obviously, when a comb is bigger and off, you know, standing straight up like on a leghorn, and the higher up it goes, it increases the possibility of that comb freezing. That's why chickens freeze to death, because, and, and it's detrimental to them because all that blood is going through the comb. So, brilliant, brilliant history. When you take a bird that's from upstate New York, they put a rose, they develop a rose comb on it, that comb stays close to the head. All right? They never have to deal with, you know, or seldom, the, the issues with freezing combs is almost non-existent. Do they trim it or? No, no, no. That's the kind of comb that it is. There's eight different kinds of comb in the standard of perfection. Eight different, you know, styles. There's a cushion comb and a rose comb and a single comb and a buttercup comb and a strawberry <laughs> comb. And, all right? Yeah. The large combs, does that allow them to, in hot weather, are they more heat tolerant? Does that, is that a means of cooling them? In That's exactly weather? right. Oh, okay. Yeah, a, high, a bigger comb. A leghorn is a Mediterranean bird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. The second thing that a comb does is, believe it or not, this is, you know, chickens, our poultry, are attracted to red. That's why uh, you, you find those waters and feeders that are all red bottoms, okay? They're attracted to red. It's also why the male is brighter red. He draws the females in, you know, does his thing. They actually naturally mate, Jan, like the ones you saw in the wild. Okay, and that's the idea, all right? They're also, because they're attracted to red, and they're cannibalistic. That's why when chickens see a little blood, you know, it's like they're going to devour their brother, their sister, their cousin, or mom, or their dad, okay? They're very, very cannibalistic. And typically, you know, cannibalism is caused from one of two things. They're, they're too close together, they're crowded, and they're bored. Usually it's a combination of both. When we got 8,000 toms in a 25,000 square foot building, and the old testosterone kicks in, then boys are like looking for something to do. All right, so we got things hanging from the rafters, and we put bales of hay in there, and like trying to de detour them from their crowded activity. All right, so that's the silver lace wine dog. There she is again. She's a beauty. All right, this is a Chanticleer. The only Canadian creation developed by some Canadians in Quebec in college a hundred years ago, a hundred plus years ago. It's the only bird that has a cushioned comb. Again, it's a comb that's close to the head. This bird also, in good breeding lines, we have certified flocks of these down in, in, uh, in Missoula, this very line of partridge and clairs. But they also were bred to have a smaller waddle to deal with the, the cold issues in Canada. It's amazing to me when you study the history of these breeds and look at how they were so strategically developed for the region in which they come from. And there's a whole bunch of birds that would do great in Montana climate. Right? And this is one of them. Okay? The Chanticleer, there he is again. Great. Uh, I've had, um, when these, we, we, We've seen, we've processed a lot of these. Chefs love them. Great bird. Really, really good bird for me. Okay. What's that? You got it. Doesn't happen very often because that is a true Rhode Island red. You need to know that a true Rhode Island red, by the way, you have an awesome flock over in the Bitter Room. I've been monitoring and, and mentoring Angela and breeding the reds for about two years now. A Rhode Island red is not red. It's a deep mahogany color, okay? So, and all your lovely hatchery birds, they come out like that new ham, kind of a light red, or a cherry agar, or a sex length, or whatever. This is a true 
Rhode Island Red. Okay, there's the male, got a little sun hidden. Isn't he stunning? I mean, and these are these birds are massive. When they were developed, they were an old homesteading breed. They're actually they don't go into production until about 22 weeks, as far as eggs, and they really don't quit growing until they're about 22 weeks old. All right, but they were intended to be a homesteader to provide for you over the long haul. Okay. So it's the, the history of these reds is very, very exciting. There's the male. Now I will tell you this. This flock of Rhode Island reds, I saw them in Australia back in 2000. And here's what's so amazing to me. I go to Australia, and they have three American breeds that I was judging. The reds, the wine dots, and uh, the, the Plymouth Rock. And here's what I understand. They were incredible based on the standard, like beautiful standard bread chicken. And here's what I discovered that really spoke to me. They said, Jim, we got those three American breeds over here in the 20s and 30s, and then our borders closed. And we knew that if we didn't preserve these three American breeds, we would never see them again in our country. That's the respect they had for those three breeds and for the United States of America. I have incredible have this huge respect. And I thought, you know what? And what happened here is somehow we lost that sense of preservation of keeping these birds the way that they were originally intended and putting them back to work what they were intended to do. It's just kind of like, wow. You guys what were those breeds, Rhode Island Reds? Rhode Island Reds, Plymouth Rocks, and Wine Dots, all three American breeds. This is a Delaware chicken. Okay? We're working real hard with these. Um, they are, we need right now, we're at about 16 to 20 weeks. And there's no good Delawares left in the United States, at least to my knowledge so far. I'm on the hunt looking. There's a gal, she emailed me yesterday, said, I got a, I've got good ones. I'm going to go look at it at some point. <laughs> we'll see. There's a male. Um, this is the Buckeye chicken. This is, a, this is what Sharon has down in Helena, and actually Chris McVita worked on this afternoon. He also has very, very good Buckeye genetics. And um, he, uh, this is again that bird that was developed by a woman, um, Betty Metcalf, Warren, Ohio. I've been, some things are stirring in Ohio, and they're like, why should, if we want to be local and be sustainable, how about a bird that was developed in our state over 100 years ago? They're like, especially the Amish, they're really, really getting excited about this. So, I was, this is at Pat and Ann Lee Weavers in Salisbury, North Carolina, and we were getting ready to select the males, okay? So, um, several of these guys didn't live beyond this day, though. <laughs> All right? These are females, again, before I was selecting. Nettie Metcalf, her idea and, and the bird she created, she wanted a foraging chicken. She wanted a chicken that would work for her, all right? But she also wanted a chicken that would have the buckeye nut color, which is about like this girl right here. So as you can see, the color varies. So we teach people in the breeding process is that, you know, the, the color is not most important, but in your number one breeding pen, you're picking, you're working toward uniformity and body type and color and so forth and so on, all right? Bourbon red, turkey. Now these guys, most of them across the country are still way underweight. And so we're working to breed them back to what they originally were. Narragansett. I think um, Jacob has raised some of these before. Yeah. So I just did this quick little thing on why should we be concerned about breeding, growing, marketing, standard bird poultry. Let me, let me just, um, let me tell you why not to go to hatcheries. Okay, and, and a couple little closing things here, and we're doing great on time, and so I want to allow some time for Q&A, and then we'll take a break. Well, let me tell you, if you leave here today and go, I'll never raise a Cornish cross again, and you go to the extreme, and then you go to a hatchery, you're going to make a mistake. You want to get good genetics. Remember, all the big hatcheries, Ideal Poultry sent out 3 million chicks. It's the largest rare chicken hatchery in the world, Texas. 3 million chicks. Ideal Poultry. Okay. Actually, all the glossy magazines you get in the mail, Murray McMurray, Stromberg's, uh, Myers, all backyard poultry advertising, I would discourage you from going there because they're all about quantity versus quality. 
They are not breeding Plymouth Rocks for you to sell for meat. They are not breeding Wyandots and Orpingtons for you to have a successful, profitable business for meat. They'll produce some eggs, all right? But they're not producing quality, they're producing quantity, okay? No selective breeding. How many of you have been attacked by a chicken? Raise your hand. <coughs> okay, what kind was it? Oh, how about you in the back, young lady? Oh, what was, what was that? Okay. Must have not left a too strong of a barred rock. A barred rock. Yeah. Okay. All right. How about somebody else? What did you get attacked by? New Hampshire. Jeff in New Hampshire. So, I'll, I'll run with those two breeds. Okay. If Jeff was really scarred when it happened, let's say he was five. Okay. He's growing it. By the way, Jeff, normally when we do these, we have counseling rooms for people that are in the country. So, it wasn't that bad. I was old. Okay. So, let's My just say, typically, if that left a really strong impression on you, it was fearful, it was painful, it left a scar, whatever, Jeff will never have a New Hampshire because it'll kill his grandkids, right? <laughs> Here's what you need to understand. That is cr that is not due to the breed of New Hampshire. It's due to the tolerance of what you put in a breeding pen. So an aggressive male reproduces aggressive males. Okay? So, and they're not doing any selective breeding. Every breed of chicken in our network that I, when I go and help select the males, okay, I'll, let's just say Sharon has Buckeyes and she says, Jim, got 20 Buckeye males and we need to select them. She can do some pre-selection before I get there. Anybody who's overly aggressive, they're not going in a breeding pen, okay? And, but they can also, if I get down and I'm looking at all these males, the aggressive males go out. I mean, that's part of looking at bigger. Now, you also run this risk. If I got 20 male Buckeyes at Sharon's and I go through them and we keep five, male number five doesn't get aggressive until two months later. This happened, didn't it, Sharon? Oh, yeah. So she, she's, I want to teach all of our breeders, no matter when he gets aggressive, he, he never goes in a breeding pen, okay? Hatcheries don't do this. So you pick the breed from Wyandots to Orpingtons, pick your favorite, and the, there are different temperaments, but never ever do we put an aggressive male in a breeding pen. The issue of sexing chicks. Anybody of you ever order, I want just the girls in my shipment? Anybody? No, somebody? Okay. Here's what I would challenge you to think about. This is a little bit of a personal issue for me. Okay? The demand for those girls and not the boys in chick and hatcheries is very, very high. What do you think they do with all those males? Compost, trash. Compost, trash, grind them up, whatever. Now, Nettie Metcalf was alive, the Buckeye breeder, and said, you're doing what with all these extra Buckeyes? I think there's the stewardship issue when we're tr we could be growing these birds out. Think about just... The meat that could potentially be produced in your state, you know, from those extra males who got good genetics, that kind of thing. The other thing is shipping, the U.S. Postal Service. I don't know if you realize this, but the United States Postal Service is going away. <laughs> They're going away. They've already tried several times to shut down shipping baby chicks. And I want to, I'm so excited because... We're riding the crest of this wave that all of Murdoch's, you know the Murdoch's in Missoula told, sold 12,000 chicks last year. Do you know that every single one of those were shipped from a hatchery outside of Montana? Do you realize the opportunity that when the Postal Service shuts down and we say, hey, we've got Black Orpingtons in Ronan, we've got Buckeyes in Helena, and we've got parts of Shannon Claire's down in Missoula, and we're multiplying these breeders and getting the birds back to where they once were, that we're creating a local sustainable food movement. You know, I, I'll, I'll tell you, one of my commercial buddies told me this. He said, Jim, your heritage chickens will never feed nine, six billion mouths around the world. And I had a farmer say to me this, another farmer, she made me think. She said, wait a minute, do we have a responsibility to feed six billion mouths? Or do we have a responsibility to feed, help be a part of feeding our community? How about just helping take care of people in Montana and developing a vision in the poultry side to say, how can we produce birds here, never be dependent on an outside resource, to be local and sustainable by producing, using birds that naturally reproduce, that are good for meat and could be great for a backyarder. Most of those people who buy from Murdoch just want six or seven pullets. 
you breeders can produce those and keep all that revenue, all that momentum, all that excitement yeah. right in the state. Yeah. Question. I had a question with the, the Postal Service now. Is like FedEx or UPS just going to pick up that, or, or do you mean that as industry they're going to refuse to ship chicks? There you go. Whether it's the, you realize the Postal Service or whether it's FedEx, you know what I mean? Like um, FedEx and, and you, United Postal Service, whatever. You can pay an enormous amount of money to do direct flights. Okay. I want to encourage us to complete. I want to do our, in our network. Our goal is to never ship, never ship a chick again. Sure. No. I mean, I, I understand. Appreciate. I just didn't understand whether it was. Um, no, it's a, it's a liability the service. The U.S. particular or the, the shipping industry as a whole is looking at not shipping, or whether it was just the postal service. No, just, just the postal service. service. The postal service, it's a very, very high risk. But they're the only ones who will be. They're, they're the only ones. Okay, okay that's yes, why they, yeah. yeah, they won't. They okay. Won't I work for the post office, and I would never order a shipping. Right, right. No, no, I didn't say that. Wait, let's, let's run with that. Why? Well, that's the only option. Well, that's what I didn't mention. Yeah. Okay. Working yeah. at the post office, I see the chickens that come <laughs> in for the Hooteric colony. Wow. They bring in these crates. We call them pages that are a big yeah. rolling crates. The chicks are all stacked up on that. Oh. They're hauled in the back of a truck that's unheated, unregulated. They roll that thing out into the 40 below weather in January, roll it into our, chick or into our post office. And as soon as I hear it, I know whether we've got dead or live chickens and if they've been on the plane for three days because they got late, way late at an airport somewhere. It's ugly. I, we need to raise chickens in Montana so we're not shipping. Bless it's you. It's ugly. <laughs> All right. And I, and I love the post office. I've worked there for 27, 28 years. Um, you know, it's provided me very well, but don't ship your chickens. <laughs> Just a couple little things to, to wrap up here and we'll take a break or some questions. This is a Delaware carcass. Oh, wow. Not a bad looking bird, huh? Now this isn't a super good photo, but this is a Cornish cross. This is a bark from the drop. I want you to see that we are capable of getting a good, attractive carcass back on the kitchen the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this is uh, these are bronze turkeys that I raised this year. This is they came right out of the plucker and he was stacking up my birds getting ready to that's the same bird that's oh, a bronze nice. turkey a true heritage bird to naturally reproduce out on range out on pasture running around um, very attractive there he is again okay I always tell chefs or you know I would say why should you consider these birds time increases flavor they have more texture, muscle, nutrients, they're sustainable, they're local, they're proven to be more healthy, welfare, humanely treated, and the customers want it. Okay? So, we got a few minutes before anything that has to do with this. Uh, let's take a few questions before we take our break. Yes, sir. So, with the mail going away, et cetera, that's the only way I've been able to get birds. Mm -hmm. The type of birds I want. What, do you produce a listing of Local yeah. breeders, et cetera, you, you reference the first thing, I, first thing I would encourage you to do is Sharon has Buckeyes. Uh, we will have Dorkings. We'll have Dorkings. Uh, we'll have these Dorkings. If we find, we're working on Oh, no, they're, they're coming. Oh. <laughs> we overnight got the money to them, and they are going to be here. Where are they coming week. from? Um, the Yellow Farmhouse. The Yellow, the yellow House Farmhouse. Oh, the, the Rose Cone White Dorking. Yeah, the, yeah. So what's a Dorking? <laughs> very, very. Back to Julius Caesar. Oh, really? Oh, really shortly. Yep. Yeah, a, um, find it in here, and I want you to read the little thing on this. So, um, so uh, what, the response. So, if she has Buckeyes, um, a model Java chicken. We have a flock of those down in Helena, Brent Sarche. Um, we've got. So we've got partridge chanticleers over in Missoula. We've got Rodon red flocks. All these flocks are in our network, and it's in Montana is growing like crazy as far as people who are interested in this. So here is our this is our website for the network. And then what I want you to see when you go to it is if you click on here to recognize flocks, they're all listed. Okay, Sharon's on here. Chris McVita, who's here in Great Falls. You go down through here. See, there's flock number two, Canyon Creek Poultry. She's got bourbon red turkeys, single cormoran red, spawn and white runners, and then geese. All right? And uh, so we're aggressively 
not so much even by my choice, but we're certifying flocks all over the country so that when you, when I teach here, you say, where do I go? I'm not trying to be a middleman, all right? We don't need, I don't need to be a Tyson. Our idea is, is to connect you directly to everything that's local. So you can go and you can find these birds uh, on the website. So you can see the whole list. Now these are by flock numbers. Um, here's a, a Narragansett turkeys in bronze down in Hamilton. And uh, so the flocks are not, we may change this, but they're not split up by states. They're split up by flock numbers and who's certified and so forth. So, um, but also on our website, um, I, I would encourage you to, we're, we're actually the, the producer of the website's from Missoula. Actually, even though I live in North Carolina, a huge part of our support and what's happening in the network is all in Montana from the flocks and so forth. Yeah. Could you talk about you know, the certified? What that means? Yeah, basically, um, well, I just want to I'll show you the blog. There's usually we try and put some, uh, some good educational things on there, whether it's me writing it or somebody else. Um, we do the workshops, uh, we've, you know, and, and different workshops, and we need to continue to do this in, in Montana. But when we certify birds, the idea is this. First of all, I never recommend a flock to you unless I've seen the parent stock or the grandparent stock. Okay, so like what Sharon's referring to the Dorkings, you know, she was on a hunt to find the breed and I told her of a couple sources to go to. She stopped a gold mine getting them from Yellow House Farms. That's up in, I think it's Massachusetts. Okay. Um, and you actually got him to yeah. ship them? Oh yeah. Yeah, they, they have a weird way of doing things, but you have to be on, you have to contact them in January, get on a list, three weeks later they'll contact you by email, and then it's whoever gets their money there first <laughs> gets on their list, because they only breed so much, and then you're on the list according to whose money got there first. Well, Tom wanted to be on top of the list, so he overnight expressed his money. <laughs> he says, I want my Dorkin. That's great. And so we got a little thing in the mail just like a week ago saying they're going to be here early April, mid-April. 25? Yeah, 25. He, yeah, we, we're still working on coops and everything, and so right. we just went with 25. So coming back to Jan's original question, um, certifying flocks is... is Remember, it's all about the genetics. So once you, if you say, you know, like, I want Dorkings, you get this breed. You know, if, if we don't have the breed within our network, and you say, I really want to be a, uh, I want to breed a line of Orchid or Speckled Sussex, one that we don't currently working with. If Jan says, hey, Black Orbs, we'll go on a hunt. We'll find the breed she wants. I will walk her through those steps of certification so that when, so there's continuity and credibility that since I can't get good black orping pins from a hatchery, and I live in Idaho, can I drive to Jan, Jim, can I drive to Jan 26 in Ronan and buy those birds? Absolutely. Okay, so we're, we're creating a, a credible list uh, with, and I have a, a whole certification outline, and part of that is us coaching you um, and helping you to select those breeders. Good question. Yes, sir. Um, so for these certified flocks, what's kind of the, the low end or the smallest? Like flock that's you've seen to be economically viable, and how much land did they need? Yeah, well, you know, just roughly kind of broad strokes. Let me give you. We talked about this last night. Okay, there's five bottleneck issues to get this thing, keep this thing growing in Montana. Number one is breeders. Okay, the second one is growers. Let me talk about those two for just a minute. I'm convinced for us to be productive in Montana, you can't do both. So, if Sharon says, I will produce as many Buckeyes as people want to grow them out. So she has the breeding flock. See, this is from the industry, and they've done it well. They actually took it from us, you know, the small guy, and turned it big. But you never, when you grow for Tyson, you never are a breeder and a grower. So we need breeders of Buckeyes, breeders of Bard Plymouth Rocks, because the, the, the effort and the focus of breeding very, very important. So you don't need as much, you can have a breeding flock to be as small or as large as you'd like. Depends on how many chicks you want to be able to produce for local people or local growers. Now you as a grower might say, hey Sharon, I don't care about breeding. 
You keep them year round. You house them year round. You pick the males and Jim coaches you, but I want to benefit as a grower for all the hard work you do in the breeding. And you say, but, but Sharon, I'll take 500 of them and I want them May 1st because I'm going to process them April or May, June, July, August, around September the 1st. That's your, and you have a market for them. So you're, you want the bigger numbers, so you do need more land. And basically, we say about 200 birds an acre if you're growing the birds out. Okay. Do they have to be hatched naturally? No, we do, we do, um, you know, a lot of times in workshops, people say to me, well, how are we sustainable if you use artificial incubation, okay? We, we use artificial incubation, but, and part of what you need to understand, certain breeds of chickens were never developed to be broody. So your old English and your silkies, there are setting breeds. But remember, when she starts setting on a clutch of eggs, you know what she does? She shuts down. She quits laying. And if Jan's raising, what's your favorite color? Black Orpingtons. Yeah. If she's raising Black Orpingtons, and you want 200 of them, and she's only got X amount of breeders, and she's producing for you, every egg's money. Yeah. <laughs> so you're like, no, girl, come on. No, 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 no. Good idea, but let's, I need you to keep producing. It's springtime, and we've got to produce chicken. Yeah, but they'll still get broody. They will. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Breeding, you can, that's part of what we teach breeders. You can breed that out of them or you can breed it in them. Yeah. So from a grower's perspective then, with our, is there, do you mix breeds? Not, you know, to, to yeah. grow out, depending on the season, it's a great depending question. on the landscape, great you know, question. time of year. Are they great breeding? question. My response, three years ago I would have said, what's your first name again? Warren. Warren. Three years ago I would have said, Warren, go ahead and, and let's order three breeds and figure out what you like. If you want to breed, you become an expert in a specific breed. Well, from a grower's perspective, I mean, I want to... Oh, it wouldn't it matter. Just you could, it would be great, actually. You could say, Sharon, I want 100 Buckeyes. Uh, Brad Isbell in Missoula, I want 100 Partridge Chanticleers. Oh, and I think I'll grow out 100 Orpingtons, and I want to grow out all three. You can, you can, as a grower, you're comparing how they grow. As a grower, you're comparing how they act, how they, you know, how they respond to your terrain, to right. your... And then you also are comparing a carcass. And you can give three different breeds to a chef and say, what do you think? So as a grower, you've got a lot of flexibility. So but is there any, um, any as far as just the seasonality of it? So these breeds will grow better in cooler weather, wet weather, these birds will grow better? In yeah, I think all the birds that I mentioned, the yeah. Chanticleers, the Buckeyes, some of those called the Wyandots, uh, even the Rocks, would, the Rocks would do here, New Hampshire's would do fine here. They do have little bigger cones, but I don't think it would be especially in the grow out, you could grow any of those birds would do well here. So what if forages were equal to carcass weight as far as traits that you're selecting for their food? How much service they cost to the ground? So like really aggressive foragers? Good genetics, good genetics, good foraging birds will tear it up, about all of them. Uh, so there's not any specific thing? Now buckeyes can be a little bit more aggressive. Uh, they're great. I mean, yeah, they're, they're great, the hens are great. The rooster's a little, a little bit aggressive there. I, you just gotta, you just gotta make sure you. See and understand this. Room. Sharon started with two trios, or how many males and females? Two males and then um, just ten females. Okay, so two males and ten females. So ideally, and I'm her coach, so I help her through this. Ideally, if you only, so you gotta start with what you got. Now she got great genetics. But when she develops more males, or hatches more males, now we can say we've got to be much more uh, um, intentional to make sure we aren't tolerating that aggressiveness. But she really doesn't have a choice right now because that, she's starting with what she got. Now she could get some more males in her trade with Chris up here or whatever. That's part of my job in, in coaching her as a breeder. Okay, so, so there's a number of breeds you could get. Uh, what we were talking about the Buckeye is just that that bird's growing popular across the country because it is people like one of small farms and city areas want to tie that chicken into their gardening and want it, they want to turn that bird loose and want to do some rototilling that kind of thing for it. Yeah. Um, going off of the breeding, when you're like you started with X amount, you kind of sent they they get sent through a bottleneck every time you do that selection. How do you know when you're you're saying you're selecting out the more aggressive birds? How do you know you're not cutting out some ancient you know? You don't. She does gene for no, resistance. I don't, I, don't, I don't care to fight with that rooster every time I went out there. Fair enough, fair enough. It was, it was, you know. It you was learn your breed by breeding. Sorry. So she, 
two years from now, she's going to have, she's going to be able to have a much better pulse on the line of buckeyes that she's breeding. Okay. And uh, now the other thing is, remember this: is that there's in breeding. Okay, we're leaking over into breeding. There's a 10% rule across the board. So only about 10% of your birds are breeder quality. So you hatch 100 birds, about 10 of those. So the more you can create, of what the larger gene pool you create, the better breeder selection opportunities you're going to have. Jim, and, um, and I'll take a couple more. I'm just kind of curious break. on um, heritability um, of certain characteristics. I know, well, we're sheep producers, so right. you know, there's been a lot of genetic. Um, um, Development in the Suffolk breed that they the heritability of the, the growth of the breed, but then that affected the heritability of milk production. So, it, are there certain characteristics that have higher heritability? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah. And and that is a great. I don't know if you understood what she was saying, but I'll illustrate it to you this way. That's why a dual purpose chicken. You can't say I want to focus on all of its meat qualities, because then it quits laying eggs. And if you focus too much on egg production, you lose the meat quality. That's exactly what happened with the Buckeye. Uh, Don Schreider, who's our, in our network, one of our instructors, one of our writers, they started, he worked for American Livestock Breeds Conservancy. In 2006, there was 72 Buckeyes left in the United States. They said they did a recovery project. So in 06, 7, 8, 9, 10, how many years? Seven years? Okay. We have a lot of their genetics. They spent so much time focusing on a great carcass for meat that, in a sense, they neglected the egg side. So we're working toward improving that egg production in the Buckeye. Okay? And now, you know, just in our network alone, with our certified breeders, we hatched from coast to coast roughly about three, about 3,500, <coughs> about 4,500 Buckeyes. And about seven, eight years ago, there was only 72 left. We're putting those girls and boys back to work to what Matty Metcalf had originally intended and create this local sustainable food movement. Right? So we need to take a break. Um, I'll be around all day. So let's have a stretch break, coffee, restrooms, return here, get some fresh air, wake up.